to introduce our next speaker, Elmer Yuan, chairman and founder of Hong Kong Freedom Beacon. He's also affectionately known by many of you as Yuan Baba, right? <laughs> so Elmer was born in Shanghai and escaped with his family to Hong Kong when he was seven. Unfortunately, his mother was not able to join the family for 20 years because she was imprisoned by the communists because she would not renounce her Christian faith. Elmer's intimate knowledge of the Chinese Communist Party began in the 1970s when he started many businesses, including the first NASDAQ-listed Hong Kong firm, TeleArt Inc., and he developed the largest golf course in Shenzhen, China, just outside of Hong Kong. But you may wonder, how did he turn from a successful entrepreneur to an activist freedom fighter? It was during the outbreak of COVID, and he was quarantined with his daughter in a hotel She's in the entertainment business, and she decided to interview him live on YouTube. She asked him, what do we do now that the Chinese Communist Party, the CCP, has violated the two-system rule set to expire in 2047 and is now taking over Hong Kong? His unfiltered response to his daughter that we must eliminate the Chinese Communist Party So his response went viral on social media, and he became an instant icon, a beacon of hope and freedom for all those around the world who are fearful of the Chinese Communist Party's sphere of influence. His courage to speak out against the CCP on leading Chinese media outlets and on multiple YouTube channels has led him to sever his Chinese business ties, and he's exiled from his homeland of Hong Kong. Please join me in welcoming a man of tremendous courage, Elmer Yuan. Thank you. Thank you. Be seated. Liberate Hong Kong. Revolution of our times. Guangfu Hong Kong. That I leave it to the secretary. <laughs> it all came one and a half years ago in Hong Kong. I wanted to visit my kids before I came to Washington, D.C. And uh, I by accident or what, I saw a YouTube uh, by Secretary of State when he formed the Commission for Unalienated Rights. It was about uh, more than, about two years ago. And it sounds very strange, you know, it sounds very strange. And uh, so I was watching it. And also, after I came to Washington, I went to their first anniversary. Also by accident, totally by accident. I mean, we Chinese don't really understand rights. We always believe when you have money, you have rights. So, um, seriously, I mean, we can buy power, we can buy freedom, we can immigrate, and we can do everything with money. So why do you need to have uh, rights? It, this, is, I'm, this is common belief, very common. And, uh, um, and most of the Chinese leaders or even normal people don't understand this universal value. I was in Beijing um, exactly two years ago, and some official invited me to a barbecue uh, in the sub suburb of Beijing. And this was the year when they had the riots in Hong Kong and the protests. And this official uh, from the Reform and Development Commission. It's very powerful, you know, the head of that. He asked me, what's happening in Hong Kong? What does the young people want? And I, of course, told him freedom, uh, rule of law, and democracy. And he said, this is 
not real. That's what he told me. This is not real. And I suddenly woke up. None of these communist people understand what that is. Because in our family education, we don't talk about universal value. In our schools, we don't talk about it. In our legal system, and there's no church to teach you. This whole thing, the entire communist leadership and or normal people, because they brainwash everybody, these universal rights does not exist. And uh, uh, it's only about maybe like 20 years ago, by accident, I was taking some um, Texas oil men to China to see some uh, uh, in Xinjiang, very uh, Turin Basin, very famous oil field. And they start asking me, what are you going to tell your children? What are you teach your children? I said, I let them do whatever they want. He said, what about the right, what about the uh, value? What about value? And I, this is really the first time I hear about this value. Chinese, of course we have our value from Confucius, thousands of years, but not the universal value. It's very, very different. So anyway, I was following Secretary Pompeo. I, I don't know him, you know, nothing at all. So I, I said, very strange. I start understand the unalienated rights. I was learning you know, not too long ago, probably two years ago. And I uh, start to enlighten me. And I was educated in this country. I have been in this country for more than 20 years. And even if I don't understand, most of the Chinese don't understand. Right? Most, I'm not taking okay, most, seriously. Uh, it's a very serious issue because they don't understand. And uh, they've never, the, the, all the communist people, all, all mainland China, they have never experienced the rights. They're happy, they work very, very hard, they make their money, they buy their apartment, and then, but they never have a chance. Uh, and, and, and in China, if you get arrested, you go back to take care of the policeman, this and that, and then you're off. If you can't take care of the policeman, you take care of the judge. That's how things work in China. <laughs> <laughs> take care of the judge, and there are millions of ways, all right? So, so there's no law. There is no law. <laughs> this whole thing about law is nonsense. There's no law. This whole thing is for show. I came to this country a year and a half ago, and I understood them because I work with them. I make money with them, all right? I'm very, very close to the families, so-called the powerful family, all right? And we do business together all over the world, uh, looking for minerals, uh, natural resources, and then flipping them back to China. Lots I've done all before. So I know the system really well. So the, um, I came here, I know the system. Uh, so I came here a year and a half ago, and I proposed to the U.S. Congress, to several congressmen, I said, these guys are criminals. For the last 70-some years, they're criminals because they don't have to follow the law. law. They use influence, they use money, and uh, uh, they can overcome everything. These are criminals. So um, my uh, lawyer looked up, there's a law called Transnational Criminal Organization, TCO. There is a law in the States called TCO. So, and fits perfectly with the Chinese Communist Party. Fits perfectly. Because every time they do something wrong, we start focus on that thing and forget about what they did in the past. This is very common, all right? Oh, now we blame them for pandemic, and suddenly the focus is on Afghanistan. It will forget about the pandemic, where, where, the, where, the, where the virus leaked from. It's been going on. We need a collective term over the last 72 years. It's not just one crime or one crime after another. It's a continuation of crimes. It's a transnational criminal organization. That's what it is. Taking Hong Kong, taking Hong Kong. Everything they signed, everything signed. The, before they signed it, all right, they, they think about how to, how to get away with it, all right? When uh, I remember when uh, Zhu Yongqi, I was representing the U.S. team when they go, then we negotiated with the uh, WTO, all 
All right, and Xi Yongji, and they asked me, uh, the uh, CIA in Hong Kong asked me, what do you think? What do you think is going to happen? I said, they'll agree to everything in the last minute, 11 hour, 59 minute. And it turned out to be true. They thought I was a genius. But I know how the game they play. This, they're a very, very good game player. All right? they, gave, they paid last minute, and then Zhu Yongji walked into the hall, the negotiation hall. Most of the Americans are ready to leave. They are heading for the airport. All right? And then Zhu Yongji came in. Oh, what, what are your differences? Show me. So there are five differences. He took two of the most important differences in favor of China. And said, OK, I agree with this, and you must agree with the other three. Of course. And that's how he won the negotiation in the last minute. So people said, wow, it's a relaxation. And after they signed the WTO agreement, nothing. They followed nothing. And, 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 and after he signed, Zhu Yongji signed an uh, order to sign, uh, the Chinese became very miserable. Said, How can we follow these terms? They are too hush. Zhu Yongji said, agreement is a dead object. We are alive, meaning we can manipulate. That is, that is their way. That is their way. Hong Kong, uh, British, Sino-British John Declaration. First day. They all planned to take over Hong Kong, all right? And everything they promised, now, of course, now we know, means nothing. You cannot deal with such people. You have to decouple with them. There is no other way. I'm going to, since the Republicans are not in power, so I'm going to spend the next two or three years to travel to all the different parliaments of the world, such as uh, UK, such as Lithuania, such as uh, India, and uh, Australia, Japan. I'm going to convince them that they have to discuss about the transnational criminal organization. <laughs> and every... And every Communist Party member is a criminal. <laughs> Unless they resign right away and confess what they've done wrong and ask for forgiveness. Total criminal. We have quite a few of them in this country, especially California. <laughs> they, are, they help operate the big tech. The H-1Bs, those are the people you must watch. They are actually operating those social medias, those big tech, the software company. They are operating them. Never mind what the boss says. They are doing an operation. And they listen to order from Beijing. If, if, if Donald Trump had another term and if the secretary is still in the uh, Department of uh, uh, State, I think all this will change. You know, after... <laughs> after Houston, after closing down their consulate in Houston, I hope the next one will be San Francisco. <laughs> So anyway, we have to wait. We have to wait. And I hope I can help. This is California. I can help to organize California. Nobody believes California can win. I want to show the GOP, C-A-G-O-P. It's not that hard. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So anyway, I'll be traveling, and I'm going to talk to different parliaments that the sovereignty of Hong Kong does not belong to China. <laughs> the communists have violated the John Declaration and grossly bleached the agreement. So as a result, I mean, under law, 
if you have not fulfilled your obligation, right, you, you, you also lose your rights. So the rights to Hong Kong should revert to Britain. And I must say here, the British were cowards. They did not stand up to the Communist Party. They gave Hong Kong people away. And we want it back. We want a referendum in 1997, all right? Based on the residents of 1997, those are the Hong Kong Yan, uh, Hong Kong, you know, Hong Kong Yan, we call ourselves. And those people should have the rights to determine their own future. So I'm going to convince, hopefully also later on next year, you win the midterm, the US Congress, that the sovereignty of Hong Kong belong to the people of Hong Kong. And of course, we must get rid of the transnational criminal organization. I remember a few months ago, I was uh, having, uh, uh, I think, a, a lunch with, uh, with Mao Xu. I think uh, it's a very good, it's a, it's a steakhouse, I remember, really. Uh, very, uh, very Texas kind of steakhouse, Longhorn. It's called Longhorn, right? And uh, I, I still cannot remember who brought up the subject of uh, having to do this kind of a, a, a speech or speaking tour. So somehow, uh, and I still can't remember, but we came up with the idea. And uh, I, I like San Francisco because of the Chinese food, the Hong Kong food. <laughs> so I've been traveling back and forth to get a refill <laughs> of, of uh, Cantonese food. So there's a lot of friends from Hong Kong. And this is probably the highest concentration of Hong Kong Chinese uh, in, in, uh, in the United States. Right? And uh, so I came here and I discussed with people. They say, oh, it's not easy, all right? Uh, we don't have that many people because Hong Kong people never have to unite, all right? They were always having uh, big eating parties, all right? <laughs> New food, this and that. All they discuss, you know, we are basically Cantonese culture. All they discuss, day and night, is what to eat. <laughs> so it's uh, very difficult for me to switch their attention to human rights. <laughs> they say, you're not going to make it. At the most, we have 200 people attending, right? And, uh, and uh, you charge too much. Nobody's going to pay that. So, but look at it. Look at it. <laughs> this is not the last time. This is not the last time. We will win. We will beat the hell out of them. This California is heavily, heavily infiltrated. Up and down, left and right. So it's a very, very serious situation. We need to do something. Even though I'm not even American, I'm not even a resident, I'm still on my visa, on my law. But I can see it. I've lived in the States total 20 years. This is like my home. I have six kids out of six, four are American, have American passport. So it's like my second home. So anyway, maybe I speak a little too long. So I need to, <laughs> I need to introduce uh, Mao Xi. And uh, I want to thank you for your support. This is out overwhelming, absolutely overwhelming. And uh, I want to introduce Mao Yu. Uh, my Chinese friend, and uh, who, who has made it all happen. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Elmer. That was a very inspiring. You know, freedom's cause without Elmer Yuan is like a revolution without music. So it's going to be very boring. Uh, 
So uh, uh, thank you, San Jose. Uh, I, uh, I remember San Jose for a very peculiar reason. Uh, 35 years ago, somewhere around that time, I got my first speeding ticket in America. <laughs> right here in San Jose. And uh, you know, uh, uh, referring to what the Emma was saying, I actually enjoyed that moment because that was the first time out of China I actually could go to American court to defend myself. <laughs> I, knew, I knew at the time it's a lost cause, but I enjoyed the right. But I couldn't do it. Yeah. So, so that's San Jose. And I also, I remember before I left the Bay Area after getting my PhD, I left for uh, Annapolis, Maryland to become a faculty professor at the United States Naval Academy in 1994. One of the last things I did was to help a friend of mine who's a professor at San Jose State University to move into a new house. He spent $330,000 that was very expensive to him. He told me the other day his house now is worth 2.7 <laughs> million. So uh, that's a very important thing. Now, um, the, um, I have a prepared speech, but uh, you know, uh, in, the, um, in the interest of time, so I'm going to basically cut down some of the stuff. I just read some of the relevance over there. And thank you for the warm welcome, and I very much appreciate it. Um, and I appreciate it. Uh, uh, all the more because, in all honesty, I, um, I never expected to be uh, in front of the big audience like this, uh, giving remarks on a Sunday afternoon. Uh, I'm sure that uh, the policy wonk uh, uh, isn't your type of guest either, uh, but uh, you made me feel right at home, so thank you. Uh, when I speak publicly, uh, at the events like this, uh, it's normally a part of my job as a professor. Uh, being at a church makes me feel, uh, think of the advice I also give uh, to, uh, to my students, and that advice is in order to, for something to be immortal, it doesn't have to be eternal. Uh, I'll start with uh, some uh, background. I came, like many of you, I'm an immigrant. Uh, I was born in a remote area in Anhui province in eastern China. I grew up in Chongqing during the Cultural Revolution. Um, my son was born in the USA, and I often uh, tell him stories about what life was like then. But it's hard for someone who's only known American freedom to understand. Uh, when I was a little older, I came to the US for college. And in the late 1980s and early 1990s, I spent seven wonderful years in East Bay at the institution called the University of California at Berkeley, getting my PhD. Thank you. I don't know you're reporting my getting PhD or University of California Berkeley, yeah, but, <laughs> but that was a very nice gesture. A lot of immigrants um, have uh, trouble answering this uh, seemingly simple, but uh, quite, actually quite difficult question as to where you're from. Uh, so um, questions of where you're from is, uh, because I've lived in, different in a different country and in different states uh, over the several decades in the United States. Uh, but I always say that I'm from around here in the Bay Area. Uh, that's because I truly discovered myself and what I value during my time here. Uh, people joke that where I went to school is so woke that it's basically the People's Republic of Berkeley. Uh, but Berkeley taught uh, a student from the People's Republic of China about freedom and how precious it is. Uh, there are two crucial moments I'd like to share with you that give me that epiphany. Uh, those moments help guide my teaching, my work at the State Department, and what I do today. The first came on June 3rd, 1989. In Beijing, it was already June 4th. Many of you know that date. You know it because of Tiananmen Square. At the time, I was on an American campus where we value human life, freedom of speech, freedom of association, and the truth. What I witnessed, the Chinese Communist Party government slaughtering anyone who represented the hope of a free and a democratic China. The man responsible was the West's favorite communist dictator, 
the so-called reformer, Deng Xiaoping. You know, Pat Buchanan had a very uh, different name for him that I like very much. Uh, Buchanan called Deng Xiaoping a chain-smoking communist dwarf. <laughs> uh, to me, the massacre meant the end of il uh, illusions about the Chinese communists uh, or its phony reforms. At Berkeley, I stopped thinking that there was any moral ambiguity about the CCP. I also stopped thinking about any moral ambiguity in the United States. Here, I saw Americans, whether they were born in this country, in China, or anywhere else, living side by side as equals, prosperous and peaceful. I decided that this is home. I've never looked back or changed my mind since. The second moment came a year later on July 20th, 1990. That was the day I flew back from Warsaw, Poland. The Iron Curtain was coming down. The Polish anti-communists had won. The Solidarity Party's Tadeusz Mazowiecki became their first democratically elected prime minister. He had invited activists to go to Warsaw to exchange views and map out the pro-democracy movement's future. I was lucky enough to join and to represent Chinese students from the United States. I had grown up under communism, but I then got to see the first days of what life would be like for people who were living behind it, who, who were living, leaving it behind. It was really amazing to witness. But the moment came after the conference. Sitting next to me on the plane back was the retired American professor. He kept lamenting the fall of communism and how much he disliked the United States, his own country. Now, we say he was woke. <laughs> I can't remember if I was in a window or an aisle seat, but I couldn't get away, so I argued with him. <laughs> I defended the freedom and the United States and cheered the downfall of communism in Europe. It's hard for someone like this professor who has only known American freedom to understand what that event meant. I pitied him, both for his ignorance and for his intellectual dishonesty. But that, that was not the end of the story. When we walked off the plane, the professor went through the fast lane for the, uh, at the customs, marked for the US citizens. I had joined the line for foreigners. And that was a tremendous blow to me. My feeling wasn't about the line, it's about a way of life. That was the moment I decided, July 20th, 1990, that as an immigrant who loved the US, what it stands for, I must become a citizen and have an American passport. <laughs> Again, it's not about travel convenience. I wanted to be able to go anywhere in the world and for anyone to know that I am an American. And that means something very special to me. I wanted to devote my energy to this country and make sure that this nation does not fall into the hands of people like that self-loathing professor. Those two mo moments were possible because of my time here in the Bay Area. You all care about the relationship between the United States and China. Many of you still have families there. You should know who's responsible for the worsening of that relationship. It wasn't the Trump administration. It wasn't Secretary Pompeo. And it wasn't any of the so-called China hawks, not even me. Hawks and doves come and go in Washington, but the very existence of the free United States is seen as an existential threat by the CCP. We saw this a few months ago in Anchorage, Alaska. Politburo member Yang Jiechi and his subordinate Wang Yi lecture Americans' current Secretary of State and National Security Advisor. They didn't focus on specific policies. 
They, lam they lambasted and blasted the entire American democratic system as inferior to China's Marxist, Leninist, communist system. That kind of Cold War rhetoric is right out of the debates between Soviet leader Nikita Khrushchev and Richard Nixon in Moscow back in the 1950s. Today, today's blend America first crowd says the Trump administration is responsible for worsening relationships. They are ignoring reality. Uh, I'll close my remarks with one thought. I recently attended a meeting where a former senior official in the Obama administration said that under the Trump administration, we had a China attitude, not a China policy. That's not true. We had a China policy with an American attitude based on American values. We had a moral clarity, straight talk, confidence, and deep beliefs in American exceptionalism and every human being's unalienable rights. That was because of Secretary of State Mike Pompeo. No communist would have gotten away with lecturing him. As a Chinese American citizen, it was an honor to work in the US State Department helping shaping our China policy. It was an honor to make the case for freedom and democracy, causes that people like MRUN, groups like the Hong Kong Freedom Beacon, and patriots like you all believe in so deeply. And it was an honor every time I touched down in a new country to pull out American, my American diplomatic passport and to walk alongside America's top diplomat. Working at the State Department, I remember the two moments I talked about earlier. I thought about how, even if I was born, I was born somewhere else, this is the place where I'm from, America's home. For the honor this country has given me, all I can say is xie xie. Uh, And today, I have the great honor, I have another honor. I'm proud to introduce the man who led every initiative I just described and under whom I served, Mike Pompeo. Secretary, okay. Secretary Pompeo graduated first in his class at the West Point. The second best American military college in this country. He was a cavalry officer in West Berlin. He's a successful businessman who was elected to Congress four times before he becoming the director of the CIA. And he's not done yet. <laughs> so please join me in welcoming America's 70th Secretary of State, Mike Pompeo. Gosh, it is, so, it is so great to be here with you all. Oh my goodness gracious. Thank you, I love you too. Yeah. When I get that much applause before I speak, it makes me very nervous. 
Well, it's great to be here in the Bay Area. It's great to be back in California. I grew up in Santa Ana, California. Yeah. So, uh, so Miles, I got my first speeding ticket in California too. I also got my second, my third, my fourth. Uh, Elmer, I, I cannot thank you enough for the blessing you have bestowed on me by allowing me to be here today with all of you. So, so it is an incredible. It is, it is great to be here. What's, what's, what's so special about that is that couldn't happen in China. You know, I grew up here under Governor Ronald Reagan. Yeah. He was, uh, he, was, he, then, he was then my commander in chief when I was a young soldier. I got to be under his tutelage twice. Uh, your, your current governor was not amused when I talked about China having infiltrated this state. I, uh, I was at an event, it was the National Governors Association, and I, uh, I had declassified a document where the Chinese Communist Party, its military security apparatus, had engaged in a complex activity to evaluate every one of our 50 governors all across the United States of America. You'll appreciate this, they were all sitting there, it was a Saturday afternoon, the Secretary of State was in front of them, they weren't paying much attention. Uh, and then I said, you know, the Chinese Communist Party in this document I have right here has decided whether you are a friend or a foe, or if they're working on you. You should know every one of them immediately texted their chief and said, I need that document now. <laughs> uh, this is a tough place. You all are here in California. I'll talk about this in a bit. But as, as previous speakers said, never give up. Never give an inch. Keep your faith. The California dream, the California dream is the American dream, or was at least. It will come back. We're here today because we're all going to work together to restore these very dreams for ourselves and for the next generation. General Secretary Xi Jinping has his China dream. He dreams of a world under authoritarian dictatorship, the totalitarian control of the Chinese Communist Party. While we dream of freedom, he dreams of a different thing, of the destruction of individual liberty and traditional institutions especially in places such as Xinjiang and Tibet, while we dream of preserving our families' sacred places of worship, like this beautiful house of worship. He dreams, he, he dreams of stealing the fruits of our hard work in the USA, while we dream of rewarding hard work and good effort. He dreams, General Secretary Xi Jinping dreams of putting the entire Chinese nation behind an eternal great firewall while we dream of freedom of expression and free flow of information every day and everywhere. It is, it is especially wonderful for me today to be here with the Bay Area's Asian American community that is so much a part of those American dreams. Whether Asian Americans represent recent immigrants or their great-great-grandparents who came to places here like California more than a century ago, you are some of our nation's greatest patriots. In every industry, in every industry, in every industry, in every church, in every community, Asian Americans contribute immeasurably to our nation's way of life. I'll never forget when I spoke about the origins of the coronavirus. And I said that I believed it came from the Wuhan Institute of Virology, and it was suggested somehow. It was suggested somehow by the legacy media that that made me racist. The truth of the matter is, as I was standing up for the Chinese people and Asian Americans all over our great country who had been decimated. The Asian American community has understood something a long time. Frankly, as, as Elmer said, 
Uh, as Miles said, I think sometimes you all get it more than those of us who have lived here all our lives. Um, I think you understand that the biggest foreign threat to the United States of America is in fact the Chinese Communist Party. There are over one billion Chinese people who get it as well. They understand that they are living under a regime that will continue to deny them freedom and the basic human rights to which each and of us is entitled because our Creator provided them to us. You know, uh, I spent uh, two years traveling the world talking about the challenge that the Chinese Communist Party presented to every freedom-loving human being around the world. We woke America up to this. You should know this is at least 20, maybe as much as 50 pair years of U.S. policy that we had to upend, and that there were people at the State Department who didn't frankly think very much about this project. <laughs> They, they'd held and they'd clung to this view that if we just traded a bit more and engaged a bit more, that somehow the Chinese Communist Party would change its stripes. Nothing could be further from the truth. Nothing. I hope we can all have, as a result of this, a candid conversation about how we got here. Because I think that's important. And where America needs to go to live up to our American dream and to destroy the dream of Xi Jinping. We, a, a few months ago, I had the privilege to speak at the Reagan Library. It was an amazing honor for a young person like me. Who would have dreamed that this kid who grew up in California and served under President Reagan would get a chance to speak from his presidential library and talk about the ch central challenge of our times from abroad, the challenge that the Chinese Communist Party presents? We recognized, for four years, our administration recognized this reality. We saw the world as it was and not as we wished it to be. And we focused our entire governmental efforts on this. We made sure our allies understood this risk as well. We did so because we know that America is the greatest nation in the history of civilization. And we want it to remain so. It, in spite of what the wokesters will tell you, it's been that way since 1776. <laughs> and, as, and as so many of you know, we'd be an awful lot better off if Americans would spend more time in the Bible and less in the 1619 Project. <laughs> so it's worth defending. America's worth defending, and we're going to do it. You all are here this afternoon. We're going to get after it. It's why uh, nearly every single piece of legislation we put forward. We had done the hard work, and we were able to pass this with votes from both the Democrats and the Republicans on Capitol Hill. I think Americans of all political stripes now understand the threat. President Trump, of course, signed every one of those bills without hesitation. And then we built our military in a way that made clear that we were going to support, thank you, that we were going to support our soldiers. And when Beijing confronted us and lied about human rights and said that America was in decline, I can assure you, I didn't sit back and take it. There's no other, there's no other issue in the United States today that I think can unite people across the political spectrum. I think this is very important. The reason that many of you and your parents or people like my Italian grandparents came to America is they wanted to leave behind tyranny. This is something every American can understand. Our vigilance today about China is never about the Chinese people. My goodness, look at my senior advisor, <laughs> right? An amazing man born in China who came to understand the tyranny and oppression of the party that now dominates that country. That the party cares strictly about the enslavement of its own people with its Marxist-Leninist totalitarian rule. This is totally alien to historical Chinese culture. In fact, the Chinese Communist Party is not only the greatest foreign threat to America, it is the greatest, for, it is the greatest threat to the 1.4 billion people still living on the mainland there. A little story. A little story. Uh, there's a, a city from about 30 miles called Burlingham. How many of you have been there? 
It's in San Mateo County. There's a town, it's a little bit smaller, called Burlingham in Kansas, right near my hometown of Wichita in Kansas. It's in Osage County. The Osage and San Mateo are very different places. <laughs> Both Berlin games are named after one of America's finest diplomats and one of the Chinese people's greatest American friends. His name is Anson Burlingame. In China, he was known as Puan Chen. Anson Burlingame was a founding member of my party, the Republican Party, the party of Lincoln in the 1850s. He was President Lincoln's ambassador to China during our Civil War and the Chinese Taipung Rebellion, serving there between 1861 and 1867. Tough years here in America, tough years in China as well. During his tenure, he developed a deep friendship for the Chinese people. He represented the United States with a profound respect and fairness for justice, for transparency. Few other nations treated China that way, but Burlingham worked to block European nations. Their imperialistic demands on China and the bonds he felt with the Chinese people were reciprocated. They appointed him, this is amazing, to head the first ever Chinese delegation in treaty no negotiations with foreign nations hoping to reach a fair set of bilateral agreements with the West. He took the court up on that offer, and in 1868, he led the Chinese delegation to Washington, D.C. He successfully negotiated with the Johnson administration, what became known as the Burlingham Treaty between the United States and China. It was the first treaty based on full equality between the people of China and a Western nation after the Opium War. It's a, it's a special story. It's a really special story. Mark Twain wrote an obituary for Burlingame in which, the, in which the greatest of all American writers said the following, quote, in real greatness, ability, grandeur of character, and achievement, Anson Burlingame stood head and shoulders above all the Americans of today, save for one or two. He was a good man. Indeed, he was a great man. And all the world a servant. We should be proud of the historic relationship between the American people and the Chinese people. Look, we've had our days here. The truth is, we've had passed bigoted laws. In 1862, the Chinese Exclusion Act was offensive, thought so by many Americans. In my time at the State Department, I was constantly reminded of the American courage for justice because just outside my office, on the seventh floor in the State Department hangs a big portrait of John Watson Foster, one of my predecessors, the 32nd Secretary of State. He was the most powerful person, the most powerful voice at his time fighting against that law in 1862, an American Secretary of State. Indeed, what that points out is one of the most exceptional things about our country. It's our ability to make good on our revolutionary founding promise, that founding promise of equality for every human being who lives in our country. And, and today, you know, there's a, a cause that has made it so. Chinese students study at our universities more than any other nation in the world. Nearly 40% indeed of all of our international students from nearly 200 countries around the world hail from China. The Chinese people love America and they choose the U.S. as the top place to send their children for education. Their professors may think this is a racist country, but they do not. They come because it's the most successful multiracial society on the planet and the greatest country to ever respect the rights that the Lord has given to us. You know, you know, Secretary Xi talked a lot about a century of humiliation uh, and how the Chinese Communist Party is leading the country to national rejuvenation, his words, not mine, because it was abused by Western powers. This is his storyline. This is what he tells his people and indeed told American leadership. But the two stories I told about Secretary Foster and about Anson Burlingame showed that the United States treated China and Chinese people with respect and that helped build the deep friendship between our peoples. No, the CCP is an ideological party masquerading as a nation. 
They want to dominate the world. They want to change the way each and every one of you live here in the United States. They tried to convince us of the, that the virtues of America are indeed evil. Don't buy it. Don't buy it for a second. They indoctrinate the Chinese nation with lies about America and about the American people. Look, they, they have in China an ahistorical paranoia. From Mao to Xi, every Chinese communist leader has regarded the United States as pushing an international conspiracy against China and the Chinese people. And frankly, one of the worst conspiracies and one of the worst lies they tell their own people is that they, the Chinese Communist Party, represents them. The central thesis of the policy that we developed in the Trump administration was the recognition that the Chinese Communist Party does not represent those 1.4 billion people. And here's my challenge today. Here's my challenge to General Secretary Xi, if, if he's listening. I'm sure he's not, but I'm sure everybody else in the entire military apparatus who sanctioned me and my wife and my son. I'm sure they're all listening. It reminds me, I, I was sanctioned at noon on January 20th, about 12.01 Eastern time to be precise. Uh, it said that uh, uh, Secretary Pompeo, former Secretary Pompeo was sanctioned and his whole family. And uh, my son is engaged to a lovely young Christian woman named Rachel. And a couple hours later, she called me and said, Mr. Pompeo, am I marrying into the sanctions regime? <laughs> yes, Rachel, you are. Consult your lawyer. Ah, <laughs> uh, goodness. Look, here's my challenge to General Secretary Xi. Mr. General Secretary, if you believe you represent these people, hold an election. Yeah. Hold an election. Hold an election. Hold an election in Hong Kong that is free and fair. Hold an election. Hold an election in Tibet that is fair. Hold an election. Hold an election. Let the two million Uyghur Muslims out of internment camps and hold an election. Hold an election in Shanking. Hold an election in Wuhan. Hold an election all across your country. I know who will campaign against you. It will be the Chinese people. You know, it always makes me laugh when that we see this in the United States. The left wants to co-op language. They want to use different words to describe. They hesitate to use the word mother. <laughs> you know, they use names like the People's Republic and the People's Liberation Army and their news outlet called the People's Daily. We know this. Those institutions don't belong to the people. They belong to the party. This is a misuse of language and it is intentional. It's intentional, they have to lie. They have to keep the lie because they know that the Chinese relationship, the Chinese people's relationship and friendship with the American people is so great that they must tell this lie to their own people. They use their entire state apparatus to denigrate our nation so they may dominate the people of their own. So you all know a little bit of this story, but it's worth spending a few minutes. What did we get done in the four years that the American people gave us? First, we told the truth every day. We were honest. We told the truth that it was an illegitimate regime, a communist party, and what Xi Jinping is not, a democratically elected president. The Chinese Communist regime is a competitor, economically, technologically, military, and maybe most important, ideologically. And that the Chinese Communist Party is at war at, with the United States, whether we want to be at war with them or not. Our most cherished values are at risk, and the Chinese people want and deserve the same freedom that we have. Elmer spoke about the Unalienable Rights Commission. It was something that was on my heart. We, even in our State Department, had walked away from the central understandings of what was spoken about here earlier by the pastor and others about our rights having been provided to us by our Creator. 
The State Department wasn't talking about that when it traveled around the world. It talked about human rights in ways that were deeply disconnected from anything I had known. And so I tried to bring it back, back to our founding, back to the central ideas that built this great nation, laying a foundation for those universal rights that matter to every human being, everywhere. I wanted that to be the guidepost for my diplomats all around the world. And so we were able then to reverse a decades-long process of engagement with the Chinese Communist Party at all costs. We were, too, we, were, we were candid with Beijing. Uh, we demanded reciprocity and transparency. If you're going to have your diplomats spy in our country, we're going to close your embassy in Houston. Yeah. Yeah. Right? right, that consulate, that consulate in Houston was stealing secrets from all across the state of Texas and up into Kansas and destroying the capacity for Americans to continue to benefit from the fruits of their labors and putting Americans at risk. I also had the incredible privilege to consistently, and everywhere I went, meet with Chinese dissidents, brave men and women. Some of you are here today who survived Tiananmen. I met, I met, I met with men and women who, sur who survived Beijing's attacks on the Falun Gong and who escaped Tibet. We spoke up for persecuted churches all across China, Christians people of every faith trying simply to live out their life. And when senior Chinese Communist Party officials violated their obligations to a UN treaty and destroyed Hong Kong's freedom, we sanctioned them. And then when we observed the atrocities, the kinds of actions that the whole world has often said, we would never permit to happen again, right? Never again. When we saw this taking place in China, we declared that act genocide. Under my direction, we championed the great triumph of freedom and democracy in Taiwan. I, I pray. I, I pray this administration will continue to do so so that the exemplary model of Taiwan and Taiwan's democracy can and will provide powerful inspiration for people all across China. Because, because of what President Trump allowed me and my team to do, America's finally begun to treat the Chinese Communist Party truly as a threat to the United States of America. I mentioned, I mentioned Hong Kong a little bit ago. It holds a special place in my heart. I have so many friends from Hong Kong. These are amazing individuals, individuals just like Elmer, who love freedom and love America and love Hong Kong. The people of Hong Kong had a promise, and the Chinese Communist Party does what it does to every promise. It breaks it. It walks away from it. They were denied the human rights, the independent judiciary, the freedom of the press, the rule of law that the Chinese Communist Party had committed to those freedom-loving people in Hong Kong. Like so many of you, I was outraged by this betrayal by the Chinese Communist Party. The massive pro democracy protests, the brutal crackdown, and the CCP's so-called national security law took place during my time at the State Department. There were those who wanted to simply ignore it, not speak to it. But you and I both know that appeasement is not going to work with the Chinese Communist Party. We must push back. So we declared, we certified under U.S. law that the high degree of autonomy no longer existed. And on May 27th of 2020, we notified the representatives of the American people in Congress. Of that fact, two days later, President Trump went to the Rose Garden. You'll remember these remarks. He gave a press conference announcing America's withdrawal of the special treatment that had applied to Hong Kong under the one country, two systems formula. Sadly, Hong Kong's suffering continues. It appears now destined to be just another communist city. 
I can't tell you how much this saddens me and my family. When the CCP knocked down and smashed Hong Kong's freedom, it also shattered any illusions about the Chinese Communist Party, anyone, any illusions anyone might have about the regime or its trustworthiness. I think the whole world could see that. And to those of you, to those of you who are here today, who are from Hong Kong, who still have family and friends in that city, know that the world is still watching. We're inspired by Jimmy Lai, by Elmer Yoon. And I am inspired every day by the countless freedom fighters who are inside of Hong Kong. I want to make sure we always honor them. Know this, know this, the fight will be long, but these are the individuals, these freedom fighters in Hong Kong. They are the future of Hong Kong, not communism. I look forward to the day that I can travel to Hong Kong and the leadership there will itself establish a commission on unalienable rights. You know, standing up to the CCP is in the finest traditions of the United States of America. We are indeed indispensable. Whenever I traveled the world, uh, you all provided me this beautiful white over blue airplane. Thank you. It was really nice. <laughs> uh, I'm now back in the middle seat on Delta, and that's good, too. Uh, uh, but the work that we did, I pray, honored America. I pray that it honored the freedom-loving people all across the pe world, indeed, those people inside of China who are so long suffering as well. Our story here is not about racism. It's about redemption. Our story in America is about freedom. It's about a promissory note written to every human being because we are all made in the image of the Lord, of God. That is... That is, that is the America that this young boy who grew up in Santa Ana knows. We should, we should recognize, too, how the CCP attempts to weaponize information, and we should be keenly aware of it. This is a central part of its global ambition. There is not a single regime in the world with a tighter grip on information and the flow of information than the regime in Beijing. It's forced its people by gripping that information to live by the lies that they tell them. Elmer spoke about the things that he hadn't seen and he hadn't known because he hadn't had the opportunity to see them. We are determined to help the Chinese people tear down that great firewall. I mentioned, I mentioned, I mentioned this here today but because all around us, here in Silicon Valley, there are a group of people that could help us with that cause. When you see them in the grocery store, tell them. When you, when you see them at the soccer game, tell them. And if we can get them to come to church, tell them there too. As long as the CCP exerts control, over every company, every Chinese company, we must be vigilant. We must ensure that we are not contributing to the well-being of those very companies that are aiming to undermine the well-being of our children and our grandchildren. Yeah. So you all know this. They've been stealing our stuff for too long. We need to stop that. We can do this. We have to be honest about this intellectual property theft that destroyed millions of good jobs all across America. Right, the hard-won fruits of the labor of the American people were stolen by General Secretary Xi. We're still ahead. He knows it. He's going to keep trying to steal. We must not let him do that. We can prevent it. I'll close with this thought, we know this much. 
We know that we are blessed to live in this very special place, to come here on a Sunday afternoon, to talk about the things that matter most to us, the things that are in our heart, to hear from Pastor McClure. Behind the sign, behind the sign you see that says stand for freedom, there's another set of words that I saw as I walked up where it says good news. Good news. I want to amplify this message. There is good news all across our land, and there will be good news for the people of China as well, as long as we all stay in the fight. You should know those of us in the fight get beat up from time to time. I'm sure some of you have suffered this as well. But fear not. Fear not, because the Lord is with us. And I want to thank everyone who's here this afternoon. From the Pompeos, from myself, my wife Susan, and my son Nick. When I come and see a room full of freedom-loving people like you, and people who understand faith in the way that you do, then the nicks, the cuts, the beatings, the, the difficulties that come with leading this fight, I am encouraged, I'm made more optimistic, and I know that my duty continues. Thank you all so much. Thank you all so much. May God bless each and every one of you, and God bless the greatest nation in history. Thank you. None of this happens without President Donald J. Trump. None of it. Okay, we have a chance to ask Secretary Pompeo some questions. Um, where are my volunteers? If you have questions, we have index cards with pens. If the red t-shirt volunteers can hand your, uh, they'll pass out the index cards and uh, fill out your questions, we will ask Secretary Pompeo. The question, so raise your hand. Please print, we can't, because we can't read cursive writing that's scribbled. Okay. Where are my volunteers? Red t-shirts. <laughs> oh, actually, you need to stand here. So. And, and also, just raise it a little bit. Yeah. Okay, um, I don't see a lot of red t-shirts oh, running around. Okay, well, let me start with some questions. Um, so, Secretary Pompeo, what can we as ordinary citizens do to combat the liberal forces in the Bay Area? <laughs> yeah. So this is really straightforward. You all are doing it this afternoon, right? Communities, communities come together to defeat bad ideas. I'll give you the good news. I've seen other liberal communities around the world. This Bay Area is no exception. There's a lot of energy. People who never thought about running for school board are saying, take me. People who, people who never thought about running for city council are saying, take me. We're recruiting. San Mateo Amen. County's recruiting right Amen. now. Be my, I, my three things that everybody can do are work hard, build a community, and continue to pray and keep the faith. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. And, and I just need to add that many Asians are reluctant to run for office. Yeah. Can you encourage them? Yes, get out there. Get after it. Let's go. It's time. The Mer America needs you. The Bay Area needs you. Burlingame needs you. Yes. <laughs> yes. Thank you. And we are here to help San Mateo County Republican Party. Um, Second question, do you think China will attack Taiwan under Biden? Yeah. So, so this is a, 
So the question is, will, will China, will the Chinese Communist Party make the decision to attack Taiwan militarily? And this is, it's unknowable in some sense, but there are things that we know for sure. There is no higher priority for Xi Jinping than to bring Taiwan under his tyrannical control. No higher priority. It's the first thing I heard on their list for four years in every interaction I had with any of my Chinese Communist Party counterparts. Second, they might well attack militarily if they believed they needed to. But I think Xi Jinping believes that he can use coercion, perhaps some military coercion, but economic power, infiltration, espionage, and he can strip away friends and partners from Taiwan and leave Taiwan isolated in a way that the Taiwanese people will be in a very difficult place and thereby exert coercion and control. That's how he's operated in many countries around the world, to exert his influence. Those are the things the United States is quintessentially perfectly set up to push back against. We have the capacity to support the Democrat, freedom-loving people of Taiwan, and we should use every American tool, our economic tools, our diplomatic tools, our ability to convene countries like Australia and South Korea and Japan and others in Southeast Asia to unite and make clear that the costs of coercing or taking over Taiwan are simply too great. That's reassuring. On a very side subject, can you give us your thoughts on Afghanistan and what happened and what you would have done to change it? <laughs> so, uh, yes, I can give you my thoughts. Uh, let me start with first thing first with respect to Afghanistan. Do we have any Afghanistan veterans in the room today? Well, let me tell you, if they are here or you have friends or family members who serve there, tell them that Mike Pompeo and the American people know that their service was noble and important. I, I, I saw firsthand the amazing work that our, our soldiers, our sailors, the Marines that were there, the intelligence operators who were doing amazing counterterror operations, they saved American lives for two decades in Afghanistan and they should always be proud of every minute they served on behalf of the United States of America in that difficult place. The world watched America walk off the stage and leave a debacle in Afghanistan and it did not have to be that way. We, for four years, worked to achieve President Trump's mission. You don't have to guess what his objective was. He tweeted about it, right? He wanted, he wanted to get our young boys and girls home. He gave me, as his Secretary of State, the mission to achieve just that. And we made progress. We got from uh, a little over 15,000 of our young men and women there, where they were frequently the case that our young men and women were brought back home. And we had to attend ceremonies at Dover Air Force Base with their families. He wanted less of that, and we got it. We went down to 8,600 and then to a bit over 4,000, then ultimately to about 2,800 when our time on January 20th expired. We knew that we had to get the conditions right to protect the American interests that those soldiers and sailors and Air Marines had fought for for all of those years. And while we had made progress, we weren't all the way there. President Biden took over on the afternoon of the 20th of January and made the fateful decision to declare September 11th as the date that America will leave. It was a deeply political decision. It was a decision that his military had told him made no sense and put Americans at risk and American interests at risk. And it was a decision that ultimately led to the collapse of the Afghan government and sadly leaving Americans behind enemy lines and 13 Americans who perished in the departure through Kabul. This is a tragedy that the world has seen, and America's very commitment in the world is diminished as a result of this. I pray that the administration will take some set of actions that will demonstrate real American resolve and begin to regain the credibility that was lost as a result of the debacle that was our withdrawal, the execution of our withdrawal from Afghanistan. So our next question is a very common question. What are your futures politi politically? Will you run for president? <laughs> and <laughs> will you also be? 
vice president to Trump. So here, here's, what's, here's what's easy. I, I've been in this fight for the things that you all value and that we all value collectively since I was 18 years old and uh, entered the United States Military Academy. I, I could never have dreamed that I would have been chosen, that I would have been chosen by President Trump, that, I, that the good people of South Central Kansas would elect me to Congress four times, or that I'd get the chance to be the CIA Director and Secretary of State. So only the Lord knows what holds in store. Other than this, I promise you, when I see you, when I hear you, I will continue to be part of this fight for freedom. I don't know what role I will take, but know this, it is a worthy fight and we all have to find a place to advance that cause. And I promise you, I'll stay at it as well. So this may be an easier question because you've done this before. How can we stop the flow of the immigrants in the southern border? Yeah. Uh, so the question is, how do, we, how do we stop the flow of illegal immigrants across the southern border? You know, the first rule of things is you have to want the thing. So we need to elect people who want to stop the flow across our southern border. This administration has clearly demonstrated that the furthest left elements of their party who truly do want completely open border have prevailed. As for the execution of that, it took us, it took the Trump administration a couple of years to get it right. Remember, early on in the administration, we had executive orders thrown out by courts right here in California. The Ninth Circuit just kept rejecting President Trump's plans. But by the, by the middle of 19, we had a policy in place that had turned off the magnet, and we had largely managed to decrease the number of illegal immigrants that were coming into our country. Uh, we, we had three pieces. One. Anybody remember the, uh, the very first or second tweet? Build the wall, right? It was, but if it was the second, it was also the ninth and the 19th and the 29th. We were, determined to, we, were de we were determined to do that because it made sense to secure our border, to have a wall. Uh, but second, you have, to, you have to turn off the magnet. You have, to, you have to make the costs of coming here not worth the, the benefit. And so we did that when people claimed asylum in the United States. We permitted them to file their claim, but we told them they were going to remain in Mexico while that was, while that was evaluated. And then this administration came in and ripped it up. And I, I last, one last thing I have to say, uh, as I'm here in California, uh, thanks for sending your attorney general to Washington. <laughs> I mean, my goodness, she, she's in charge of this, I understand. And, uh, and, we, and we can't seem to get her to go down there and actually take it seriously. So this is again. This is about <laughs> we 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 have to, we have to make sure we have to make sure that we elect leaders that are serious about protecting American sovereignty and our way of life. So how much influence does China have on President Biden? I'm sorry. Oh, how much influence? How much influence does the Chinese Communist Party have on President Biden? Um, and, and what is your assessment of their I policy? Always, I, I always try to focus. I always try to focus on the things that I know for sure. Here's what I here's what I know for sure. When uh, the Chinese Communist Party has acted in ways that are deeply hurtful to our freedom here in America, this administration has not responded. We we know we know, we know very much that uh, that the people of Taiwan are worried that we won't do the right thing for those freedom loving people. I. Uh, I, I, uh, I, I, come from, I come from a place that is so focused on delivering on a set of policies. And I watch, I watch President Biden, who is clearly demonstrated the absence of resolve to protect those things that we care about the most. That's the thing that I'd ask every one of you to focus on. We must demand that they take the actions that will protect our freedom and our country and provide freedom for people all around the world as well. Getting close to some last question. What are some ways we can combat corrupt university systems that indoctrinate the, for the left agenda and suppress yeah. anyone? This is, a, this is a great question. Uh, this is a central question. So I think I know the system in California, but I'll speak to the system in Kansas that I know the best. Um, who, who creates the policies inside the University of Kansas school systems? Elected officials. We have the Board of Trustees. We have what's called the Board of Regents. We have school boards that are elected in Kansas. Go 
go win elections. This, the, the left has focused on this very set of issues in our K through 12 and our institutions of higher learning since at least 1968. They've worked it, they've worked it, they've worked it. And we sat back and said, we're just gonna let them work it. We have to go retake this. I, I'm, the good news is I'm seeing this happen all across the country. I, I can see parents, I was gonna use a bad word, I'm in a church. Uh, <laughs> Parent, parents, are uh, parents are deeply unhappy. And I think parents all across America are gonna get the, get, the, get the stick and get after making sure that these people, the school boards and the principals and the superintendents all across America honor the traditions of the United States of America and don't teach this junk in our schools. What is the process of holding the FBI accountable? Do they take lie detector yeah. tests? So, so here's what I'd say. I, there, there, there may well be uh, FBI officials here today, people who, people who are, no, I mean, this, in my, this, these, are, these are good people. I, I've, I have lots of friends who decided they wanted to go serve and be part of the FBI. These are young people who are amazing patriots. Some of them were serving in our military and decided to go work for the FBI, they are, they are remarkable, they protect us, they keep us safe. But when senior leaders, when senior people become political inside a law enforcement organization like the FBI, then this is the kind of corruption that we don't tolerate in the United States of America. Uh, by the way, I worry about our military leaders have become too political as well. Millie. So, Millie. General Milley. So the, so the, so the, this, I, I, I always come back to it, and I, I, I do it because I feel like I'm on very safe ground here. Our founders understood how we continue to keep the most central institutions of America directed towards the American tradition. It is that we all get out and speak the truth, work hard, elect the right people, and that goes for our, our law enforcement organizations, not just the FBI, but our highway patrols across America, our district attorneys across America, our sheriffs all across America, the people who are tasked with and risk their lives every day to keep us all safe. These cannot become political institutions. When there are riots, we must enforce the law. This is pretty straightforward. So two more questions, and I can't find that exact question, but there was a Chinese that said that he has 20 students in a Christian school and he wanted to know how to bridge the gap between the Chinese culture and their heritage with the Christian school. Oh, it's a good question. I don't know that I'm well suited to answering that question. <laughs> but but, but I, I will say this. America has a deep tradition of bringing people from lots of different cultures. And we are a, we are, we are a society that has come from all over the place. I, you know, the last name Pompeo. <laughs> I have lots, of, have lots of relatives in New Jersey that may not have been on the right side of the law every day either. Uh, we, uh, we, have, we have always been a place that welcomes people and welcomes the idea that people want to respect their historic culture as well. We should, we should never walk away from that, but we know that this is also an incredibly special place and that the idea that you become American when you come here is central to the continued well-being of each and every one of us. And I know that... Uh, I know amazing Chinese people who have come here and done precisely that. Okay, one last question, thank you. So how positive are you that the U.S. will get out of the current mess and chaos? Yeah, uh, that's easy. That's an easy question. If you ask me what day, I got no idea. But I am confident we will get out of the, the moral decay that our nation finds itself in today. I, I, don't, I don't think that solely because we have this exceptional set of ideas that are emblazoned in our declaration and our constitution. Those are key elements of it. I think it's because people come to practice their faith all across America. These are, these are the institutions, these faith institutions that provide the backbone for our Judeo-Christian country that has served us all so well for these 200 and 45 plus years now. It hasn't left, it's still in our hearts. It's in the hearts of people all across our country and I am confident that we will have this revival, we will have this reclamation of our nation and I'm counting on everyone who came here today to be part of helping make that happen. Thank you all.
here. One moment. So, will the volunteers that I recruited with red t-shirts come on stage, please? Our red t-shirts. Elmer's going to give us a close. Everybody with red t-shirts, our San Mateo County GOP volunteers, please come up. Elmer, will you close? We just need a quick photo. That's how I recruited them. Can we have a picture with Secretary Pop? You can close and we'll take a picture. Come on, come on. I want to thank everybody who come comes here. Secretary Pompeo remind me of my hero, Army General MacArthur. And uh, they have very similar background, the brightest in the West Point, and also G General MacArthur changed Japan from a tyranny, from a, almost a savage country to a modern democracy. And I hope uh, Secretary Pompeo would do the same. But one thing before we part, I want to remind you when uh, General MacArthur left um, the Philippines, he said, I will return. And we Hong Kong people will return. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Let's keep the faith. Liberate Hong Kong.